to a community college. And then I, um, I played softball and soccer. And then I switched and went to, decided, you know what, I'm going to run cross country. I did this a few years ago. So I actually had to change my body. I know what athletes go through. I had to lose, you know, because the softball, I was a little bit bigger. I actually lost probably 20 pounds, 15, 20 pounds okay. um, to run across country, tried out for the team, made it. And then the next year got on scholarship for the final two years and loved it. But the choice to switch was mainly based on, hey, now I don't have to, I don't have to travel as much. It's not the, you know, large, really long road trips. Um, it's not as much time. You can only run a certain amount of time each day and then you have, you know, your therapy stuff and your athletic training stuff. So I decided, you know what, let's, let's try this. And it was great. Loved it. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Cause I was wondering, I was reading through your stuff and I was thinking, so are you, a, are you a Bulldogs fan? Are you a diehard Bulldogs fan then? I'm not, you know, I okay. should be, but the, the, the you, man, you're, you're, you know, everything about the United States. Um, yeah. You know, I should be, but going there for grad school is a little different than being an undergrad. I do okay. follow college sports to an extent, but my nephew, my oldest nephew, is actually starting South Carolina this oh, fall. Nice. So now I'm kind of, you know, I might root for South Carolina a little. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. No. Do so it, what's that? Sorry. Do you follow college sports in the U.S.? Yeah. So I'm from I, I'm from um, a small town in New Brunswick, Moncton, which is like we're pretty much on the border of the state. So when I grew up, we used to go to Maine and play the teams playing basketball. Um, you, it's kind of like everything. It's like North American kids, right? You grow up playing everything. And then I moved over to the U.K. about five years ago because uh, my wife's British. Um, so I graduated from University of New Brunswick in Canada. So Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology kind of thing. And then when I moved over here, I was, it was basically just like, it was easier for me to get a visa essentially to get to the UK um, than my wife's. And then I was trying to figure out what to do. And then I fell into the personal training side of things. Um, and then, yeah, I just kind of started working my way up through a company called Pure Gym. I don't know if you're aware of them. They're the biggest fitness provider in the UK. Um, yeah. So now I kind of, I work with them and uh, I'm a PT and coach kind of thing on the side. So it's been good. Yeah. So I still follow it because it's weird when you move over here, everything's just soccer. It's all soccer. Um, okay. So there's no, there's no highlights of, you know, NFL, NBA, MLB. There's no like sports center top 10. It's just, yeah, it's, it's weird. Uh, but it's cool though. Different, different things, right? Very different. Yes. In the U S I think is becoming more soccer centric, like yeah. you know, people, fans and stuff but still we have other sports you know mm. where I get interests here yeah that's cool I, I think especially like soccer obviously football here you can't say soccer here people just look at you weird but um yeah like the MLS is starting to blow up and even just like little things like rugby league is starting to get pretty big like I know some oh. of the rugby teams from Canada and I think the U.S. maybe travel over here um, and yeah. vice versa so yeah it's starting to it's starting to expand big time I'd say it's good to see yeah Definitely. Um, so listen, we'll kick things off. So I know you're probably busy and you must have other calls and, and conference calls and potentially people you're working with that want to get in, uh, uh, in touch with you or a hold of you. So welcome to the Fitness Burrito Podcast. You're probably thinking strange name. Uh, but the idea was kind of just, I wanted something to be a bit catchy. People were, would kind of remember it. And kind of like a burrito, fitness and health has so many different layers. So that's kind of what the name came out of. And my housemate and my wife at the time thought it was really catchy, so I ran with it. So the Fitness Burrito Podcast, for anybody listening who haven't uh, tuned in before, is all about just helping you apply practical information when it comes to training, nutrition, anything health and fitness related, really. And today, I'm really, really excited to have a, a special guest, in my opinion, Mary Spano. Is that how I say your last name, Mary? Is that correct? Marie Spano. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Marie Spano. Sorry. So I've got the last name, but didn't really get the first name. Um, so I'm really excited. And again, I had to write some of these things down because you have so many credentials and, and qualifications. It was, it was hard to almost remember, but, and I'll get, I'll get uh, Marie to do a bit of an intro. Uh, but Marie has worked with professional athletes. I believe you worked with Olympians as well. Is that correct, Marie? I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so background in, you know, athletes were talking some in the in the NFL, NBA, MLB world, which is fantastic. So I think we're really lucky to kind of get your insight on some things we're going to talk about today. Um, you've got a master's in science, is that correct? Yep, I have nutrition. a master's in nutrition and my undergrad's like yours. It's exercise science. Yeah, perfect. And I noticed you're a certified specialist in sports dietetics as well. 
yes. which again is a qualification, probably more so relevant to the US. I don't, yeah. I'm not sure if it transfers over to the UK. Um, I noticed as well, you're certified strength and conditioning coach specialist. You got your CSCS as well. Um, mm -hmm. So just a few things under the belt, which is cool. So, um, and again, just a few other things for anybody out there who might not be familiar with your work. You worked with, you know, some of the top kind of news um, agencies or providers in the US, CNN, NBC, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, pretty excited about today, uh, to say the least. So Marie, I guess if you want to just give the, the people out there a bit of an intro about yourself, I know I've kind of probably taken a bit of it for you, but that'd be, it'd be great if you could uh, just maybe dive into it a bit further, please. Sure. So I've always, probably like you, I've been interested in sports performance from a young age, sports performance and disease prevention. I was probably like 15 when I told my parents, hey, I'm going to major in something to do with sports medicine. And they looked at me like, what? But um, yeah, I went to school and um, studied exercise science. And then I went through and um, did a master's in nutrition, worked with the student athletes at UGA, which was a phenomenal opportunity because I could dive right in and do everything from you know, research to counseling, to team talks, grocery store tours, you name it, supplement reviews. So it gave me a good bit of experience. Um, and it's a growing field. It's grown so much in recent years, sports nutrition has where now there are actually more jobs out there, like full-time jobs. It's, it's a great area to work in. Mm, definitely. Did you, always, did you always think you were going to kind of go down this route when you first started studying? Yes. Yeah, I thought about it, but I didn't have the vision of, well, how am I going to get there? Because when I was in school, there were no, there were no full-time dietitians working with sports teams. In fact, there were only a few consultant dietitians working with sports teams. So I always had that vision, okay, I'll work with a team. I just didn't know how I would get there. And I never like carved a path out or anything. Oh, yeah. Because that's one thing I was wondering now, would you say, and I, I know we'll, we'll dive into some of the questions stuff that I sent, um, but just a side tangent, would you say now it's quite difficult for maybe someone to follow the path that you have because of potentially the competition and how many people are trying to get into it? You know, it's, it's easier in some ways and it's more difficult in other ways. So for instance, like you said, there's more competition, right? But there's also so many more opportunities, especially to intern. So you can come out as a, you know, undergrad, graduate student. And I think there are a lot of internships and that's where you get a lot of jobs. You get a lot of exposure. Um, so it's, and because the field is growing, people, the need is growing or the desire to have somebody. So for instance, somebody might come out and they might not, they might not get a job in a college or pro team office or at a gym, like a lot of big gyms, you know, mm. that have several different locations. They want somebody on staff. So there are a lot of different ways you can go about doing this and populations you can work with. Like there's a dietitian here. She works primarily with ballet, not, mm. and that's not a population I know a whole lot about. There are dietitians working with, um, wrestling so mm -hmm. there's in the i even had a friend who worked with nascar for several years so there are different little niches you can go into as well okay um and just kind of a last question on that one because i think some people might be interested potentially if they're actually looking at going down the same path would you recommend because i don't know too many oh i guess i don't know that many dietitians personally but the ones that are registered dietitians would you say most of them have kind of a cscs qualification and all these kind of things that you might have i think more are getting their cscs so it's a way to once you have that knowledge base it's a way to talk to the strength and conditioning professionals mm. um, and personal trainers and kind of speak their language so you know what's what you know the athlete is going through or the even if it's a recreational gym goer, you know what they're doing. So you can plan accordingly. Yeah. And I would imagine, I guess, with your experience as well, working with professional athletes and high level athletes, Olympians is they probably as well look at that and go, okay, like she, she might know a bit more of, you know, the, the exercise science part of it as well on top of ours that you have in your kind of um, exercise science bachelor's kind of similar to myself. Right. I'm assuming. I think the ones that are very educated, you know, you've got, you have athletes that listen to like your podcast and other podcasts. So they're really consuming a lot of information. Those ones may recognize it for sure. Okay, cool. No, that's really good. And I think it's insightful as well and good for people to know that 
you know, if you're interested in going down that field and that path similar to yourself, that there actually probably is more opportunities. It's just how you go about it. And you got to be quite persistent, I would imagine, too. It's like anything else. Yeah, I mean, you probably found that when you came out, right? You had to be persistent. You had to kind of find your niche and where to work. I, I had to find that. It's like I had to, you know, Google and look up gyms in the area or training centers and say, hey, let me go meet these people. Let me tell them what I do um, and see if there's a fit and see if I can work with their athletes that are training there. Hmm, awesome. And just curious, how's your training been since like all the, the lockdown stuff? Are you, are you kind of lucky? I'm one of the lucky ones that has access to a private facility kind of thing or? I'm not, but you know what? I am lucky in the sense that over a year ago, I started building up my home gym. So okay. I got, you know, adjustable dumbbells. I got kettlebells at Thanksgiving. I got an Air 9. Um, I have a TRX. I got at the very beginning of this, I was actually in Maryland at my parents' house and I right away ordered bands because they have no equipment. And the gym was closed and I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to get something. Mm. Um, but I, I'm lucky that I have some equipment at home. I know you probably have a whole home gym, right? You know what? I don't. It's one of the things that I'm working on, but um, one of our, one of my house, like my housemate, she's a, she's a PT. I, she used to work at the gym that I managed. Um, and she's been able to get a few of the, the pieces of kit from a CrossFit gym because she goes to a local CrossFit place. So we had the same thing. We had an assault bike. We've got a rower in the back garden right now. We've got kettlebells, dumbbells, pile boxes. So yeah, we're making ourselves look a lot better through lockdown right now. Yeah, you've got some stuff. And I feel fortunate because I've had, I had an athlete, an NFL player contact me panic one day because the gym's closed and he goes, I have no equipment at home. Do you know really? somewhere? Yeah, where can I get equipment? And I... I do know a, a strength coach that sells some and he sold a ton of equipment during this period. But yeah, I'm fortunate that I have some and I'm creative enough and I'm, you know, it's challenging my creativity to do different things instead of relying on some of the same exercises. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Awesome. Well, we'll dive straight into some of the questions because I think what would, was, what would have been interesting and what's going to be interesting, I should say, with this podcast is I know... The, the amount of detail and, and the levels of nutrition and, and training exercise that we could dive into could be pretty in depth. But I thought maybe we're look, if we could look at some principles or aspects of nutrition that we could apply maybe with for the average person, uh, but still kind of touch base on some of the experience that you've had with some of these high level athletes would be interesting. So one of the first questions, this actually came from a colleague um, and he was wondering how you manage kind of individual approaches to diets and st in team sports. And I thought that was a really good question because I'm assuming it's quite intricate or maybe it's not, I'm not sure. So I'll let you take that one away. I love that question. You know what I like about it is it varies. So just like the regular gym goer, you have some people that are very, very interested and they want every single little thing dialed in. And then you have some others that you're just trying to get them to eat a bigger breakfast. Like let's start here and let's drink more fluid throughout the day. So just like, any client that goes to a gym or any person out there, it depends on their level of interest. And I always look at it like a, you know, you're making progress. Let's continue to make progress over time. Um, I think the hardest thing about in pro sports teams is that they eat on site. So a lot of it depends on the actual cafeteria and what they serve and then what's out there. And I've worked with some phenomenal chefs that, you know, they're willing to adjust things and they'll kind of portion things out. Um, I've got one here for basketball. She's amazing and she'll do everything. You know, if I ask her, can you do this? Can you send them home with a meal? And then you have others that they just don't, you know, they, they're chefs. They want food to taste good. So they modify recipes. They put anything in them. You don't know what's in them. Um, I've had athletes where you know, their stomach may hurt because, you know, they might be eating something that they they're intolerant to, or they have a food allergy or sensitivity. Um, so it, it really varies depending on the situation. It's, it's crazy when you think about it, because in my mind, and I think in a lot of people's minds out there, when you think about, okay, you know, high level athletes, professionals getting paid, you know, millions and millions of dollars or pounds or whatever you are in the world, you're thinking, oh, they must just have everything perfectly scannable with my fitness pal, right? And the, the chefs, like, and I always think this, I'm like, oh, you know, one day if I'm ever in, in a fortunate enough position where I can hire a chef, I can't wait because they're going to cook everything exactly like I want, perfect amount of protein, carbs, and fats in every meal. But the reality is it's probably actually not that like that whatsoever, is it? It's not, it's like that for a few athletes that like you take these guys that are vets and let's say they're 30 something years old in any sport and they may have a chef who really dials it in and they can take, like I can give them direction 
and they can make anything taste good, right? I mean, you have that much money, why not? It's like, you don't have to cook, you don't have to clean, you've got everything that tastes good and it's perfect, like it's dialed in for you, right? Um, I mean, it's the way we feed animals, right? You have a vet, a vet dietitian, I should say, a dietitian for animals who basically, you know, make sure that they have everything they need. Um, and in some teams, they're very, very particular. I heard, you know, one of the, one of our teams, through all the Patriots, you know, the Patriots, I heard that from one an NFL player, like yeah. everything is fairly dialed in there. Like they don't have cakes and cookies and stuff like that in the cafeteria, whereas other cafeterias don't operate that way. They may be a catering cafeteria, so they serve everybody. They may serve other people in the building, like a bunch of non-athletes. So it's not performance-based. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it depends on the team, depends on the athlete, what they want, what they're willing to do. That's a big thing. Um, the changes they're willing to make. So would you potentially have, would you be able at times to sway the outcome of what the cafeteria would offer? And is that something that you would maybe speak to the coach about or the SNC coach about? Because I was reading a good article, I think it was yesterday, about um, Atomic Habits. Have you read the book by James Clear? Oh. It's a really good book, actually. Um, I've got it right here, but it's called Atomic Habits. I've just started reading it by James wow. Clear. I highly recommend it. But in, one, in, in the book, he talks about how in, in one place in corporate America, all they did to change the decisions of people in the cafeteria was place more areas where they could access water or buy water. And they noticed that the places where they would normally buy soda, it decreased by, I think it was like 11%, but then the water consumption increased by 27% roughly. Wow. Now, I might be making those numbers slightly up, but it was around there. But I was just curious if that's something that maybe you have a hand in at times where you say, look, okay, they might be always reaching for, I don't know what they would tend to drink, but let's say Coke or Pepsi. Uh, but actually, if we, if we maybe put like some body armor, some Gatorade or whatever, uh, they might be more likely to, to pick that. So I thought I'd, I'd ask that question if that's a... Sometimes I do. Um, depends on the situation. Sometimes I do. And just like any other sports dietitian, sometimes we, we are able to do that. Sometimes it depends on the design of the cafeteria we walk into. Just like you mentioned, where you place things, you might walk in and go, oh my gosh, like, this is not designed well for the athletes. Mm -hmm. um, but I love that idea. In fact, there's also research showing that, hey, if you put fruits and vegetables and stuff up first, people are more likely to grab them in a buffet line than if you put them toward the end and they've already grabbed everything else. So sometimes I can influence that. Um, it really depends on the, either the food service manager or the chef I'm working with and if they're willing to budge. Okay. That's yeah, yeah, definitely. I was going to say, it's all about how receptive they're, they want to be, right? And would yeah. you, do you ever have specific, I guess, individual athletes come to you directly? So let's say, you know, as an example, I was on one of these teams and I don't necessarily want to have the food at the cafeteria, but I want you to have a specific kind of diet plan, meal plan with yourself. Would that be an option? Absolutely. In fact, I've got athletes that, you know, like I mentioned, they have outside chefs or we have outside food service companies. You probably mm -hmm. have those in the UK where, you know, basically meal, meal prep companies. So yeah. you can pick out things. I can look at the macros. I can kind of look at what's in it and say, okay, pick this, this, and this for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and your second dinner. Um, and that's what you'll eat. And it, it makes it a lot easier because it takes choice out of the matter if they're trying to meet their goals. And they know, hey, here's the amount of food I should be eating today. Um, and then they're also not tempted. If you go to, if you leave an athlete on their own, just like anyone, and they go to a restaurant, you know, you, they know what's healthy. They may go ahead and grab something else each yeah. time. Okay. Interesting. And I guess just kind of maybe one or two last questions on that. It, Cause again, I'm thinking in the mindset of just the, the performance based gym goer, when you start working with someone, or even if you start working with the chefs at the cafeterias, what's kind of like the basic principles you start working around with those teams potentially, or with those athletes? Cause I know you mentioned progress, right? You start maybe super simple and then you add from there. So what would be, I guess, some basic principles that you kind of start around yourself? I think the first thing I'd start around is food quality. So looking at the quality of the food, just like the average gym goer, like, you know, what are you eating each day? How do we add more whole, less processed foods to your diet? Mm -hmm. um, let's look at each meal. And then of course, meal patterns is another thing if you're dialing it down to the individual to ensure that, you know, they're having enough food at each meal. One pattern I see all the time still with pro athletes is they don't eat a lot at breakfast and then they overload at dinner. 
Um, mm -hmm. And then at night they're still snacking. And I'm like, well, yeah, you're still snacking because you haven't met your calorie needs. You know, you're seven foot one, you have a lot of calories. I know you're trying to lose body fat, but you're doing, if you ate more earlier in the day, you're not gonna be snacking on gummy bears at 10 p.m., right? So um, those are the things. And if it's like the cafeteria approach or a person's own kitchen, again, looking at those whole less processed foods, doing some substitutions. Hey, if you typically have white rice, have you ever tried red rice or brown rice or black rice? Here's what, here's why. So sometimes it's just a matter of educating people and saying, you know, try these different things or try them in a different form. Like I always say, I do not like peas. I don't want to eat them, but I love split pea soup. So there are so many different forms of vegetables. When I get somebody that's like, I don't like vegetables, I can always find something they like. Or they might not realize, oh, beans are vegetables. Yeah, I put those in my burritos, you know? Um, so it's, it's just that education piece and then getting them willing to do new things. Awesome. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I would imagine too, a lot of, do a lot of pro athletes cook themselves or do they just all have chefs? Some cook, some have chefs, some go out to eat. There's a large, um, I've had a lot of number of basketball players that they go out to eat almost every night or they get, um, you know, they get food uh, ordered in like Uber Eats or something like that. Hmm. Some do cook, some have people that cook for them. Um, it's really all across the board, just like everybody else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, I'm just curious because I think one of the big things, um, I've been trying to do with my clients as well as another coach that I work with is we're trying to, especially now, cause we have so much time is educate and help people understand how to cook better meals. So we've had chefs on the podcast and we've had chefs do live zoom videos with us just so that, you know, our clients can watch it after. And even myself in the last two, three weeks, like if you ask my missus and my housemate, they're like, Dan is unbelievable, not unbelievable, but a way better cook now. Um, cause you just try different things. So I thought that'd be interesting to know. And last question just on that, cause it came in my mind. What is, what would be the TDEE or like the BMR of a seven one athlete? I'm just curious. So like when we're talking calories, like how much do these guys eat? Um, some of them will eat between to meet their calorie needs. I've had athletes um, eat up to like about 6,000 calories, sometimes a little bit more just to gain. Um, like I've got football, I've had football players that, you know, their calorie needs are so high. And then with practice and with a lift, and then counter the fact that, you know, they're walking around. It's not like they're just sitting in one place, not active all day. Um, so about 6,000. BMR sometimes 25 to, you know, 25 to 27, 2,800. So I've had guys, they, they come to me and I'm like, oh my gosh, you're eating, you know, two eggs and a piece of fruit for breakfast. And you're, if you just sat and lived all day, you're burning 2,700 calories. Like we've got to change this, you know? They're, I'm like, this is why you're tired in practice. It's that education piece. Nice. Yeah. They must feel so different after they've had a few conversations with you and they've been eating just a couple eggs and a piece of toast in the morning. They do, but you know, sometimes it's, it's really, uh, you know, just like your clients, don't you feel like sometimes you you have to convince them it takes a little while because it's, again, especially the guys that need to lose a little bit of body fat, they're so gung ho on it that they're afraid. They're like, but if I eat, I'm going to gain weight. And I'm like, well, again, you're eating those gummy bears late at night or you're, you know, you're binge eating pizza later in the week because you've eaten 1500 calories a day for five days. Hmm. So it takes a little while for them to, to buy in sometimes. Yeah, you know, definitely. Right. Defo. I've actually, I've had probably that exact same situation happen over the last few weeks where I've actually encouraged some of my clients to eat more than they're used to. And I've been trying to educate them, look like your BMR is actually more than you've been eating. And now we're trying to almost not necessarily reverse diet, but just kind of trying to auto-regulate their body again so that their metabolism isn't that slow anymore. And then educating them on that. And then they're like, I've been eating more and I'm losing weight. How's this making sense? I'm like, well, it's just your, your body's fluctuating. It's trying to react to the changes. Um, and now they're starting to get it. So that's cool. Awesome. Um, so uh, what's that? Sorry. I love it. Yeah. I've had the same thing happen. Yeah. It's interesting too. It's it's and everyone's so different. So you can't really predict how the body reacts. And I think that's what's so interesting, but also so crazy and sometimes frustrating, maybe even as a coach, because you can't always predict how things are going to go and you might have to take more time, less time. So, and I'm sure you've, you've had your fair share of that, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yes. And then, and then again, your clients are probably then looking at you and thinking, well, what's happening? Why am I not seeing this? Or and then it just takes time. Um, so just a, so this was a, another 
kind of interesting question I had for you because at the moment, especially in the UK, and I think, you know, we mentioned earlier how things are starting to ease off a little bit in the States and that's fantastic. And hopefully everything kind of works out well. Um, in the UK, we're quite strict still. And one of the big things people are starting to ask questions about is motivations, habits, changing behaviors, especially when we're talking about like snacking and food. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to get your kind of um, insights on this in terms of like how you help people with habits. And I guess even just looking at like changing the behaviors with food, because the amount of athletes you've worked with, I'm sure you've probably come across some pretty crazy habits. Um, so kind of what's like the starting point for you when you work with someone? Oh, that's tough. It depends on the person. Um, mm. At the most basic level, it might be food patterns. Mm -hmm. um, typically, that's what it is. Like if they have that nailed, we can move on to something else. But when you said crazy habits, I had a guy 340 pounds years ago, he ate two meals a day. And I kept thinking, two meals a day, how do you get enough calories to maintain 340 at two meals a day? Probably snacking, probably didn't want to tell me or maybe drinking a lot. Um, so I'll start with meal patterns and then I'll move to the quality of food sometimes. Otherwise I'll move to portions and then, um, I'll, and then adjust what they're eating, their macros, and then look at, you know, adding variety to make sure they get those micronutrients, which is something that's often forgotten. So I might look at a food pattern and go, okay, you don't eat any fish. You've got to get omega-3 somewhere. You're not eating walnuts. You're not eating, you know, chia seeds or anything like that. How do we get these different micronutrients in there? As far as changing habits, I feel like that's a slow process. I don't know how you feel about that. I'm curious. But, um, you know, oftentimes I might start with, like, if I've got a short period of time, let's say a guy is prepping for the NFL and we have, you know, two months to work, they kind of have to make an overhaul. And then we have to almost go back and work on habits a little bit better because I feel like, you know, they had their eye on the vision but they may not have, but they may reverse back to the old state. But habit wise, I might say, let's do this for a week or let's do this for two weeks, nail this, then we're going to move on to something else. And I do work, there's um, oh, their book about habits, uh, I forgot the name of it, but probably similar to the one you're reading, where I'll, you know, have them think about why they're doing what they're doing. So for instance, it may be boredom, it may be loneliness, it may be just they get into that routine of every day at eight o'clock hey i get ice cream well what else, what are you looking for because it's usually not the food usually it's something else you know um and it might be again i'm bored i have nothing to do i'm quarantined um, i can't see people so we work on you know some of the behavioral changes like why they're doing what they're doing to try to substitute it with something else would you work with more than one person in that case, or would you manage most of that yourself? Oh, you mean like bringing another professional? Yeah. So like if, so, you know, if let's say you had somebody who you found it was quite difficult to maybe like break down their barriers or obstacles and, and look at making them really be more self-aware and self-reflective, would you then potentially kind of say, okay, I'm going to bring somebody else in and we're going to try to add maybe a bit more accountability in that sense? You sometimes I do. Yeah, that's a good point. Sometimes I do. And it might be a coach. It might be somebody that's with them every day. Hey, make sure that they have, um, oh, especially with fluid habits. Oh my gosh. Yes. Then electrolytes, then it's often a coach. It's a, the strength coach or somebody, you know, somebody like that. Um, if it's just regular food habits, usually not unless it gets to the point of a little bit like disordered eating. And I've had some athletes with disordered eating or drinking. And then I'll definitely bring in the sports psychologist. Because hmm, because part of me, when you were talking about some of the athletes earlier and maybe trying to change their patterns and, of eating and their behaviors, I was thinking to myself, I wonder if some of these guys have, like, or, like I'm assuming some of them have really good support networks where if you were to come in and say, okay, this is what you're going to do. And then you communicate that to, let's say, their, your couple best friends in the room and then maybe like their wife or their partner and then maybe their coach or PT, they're going to be like, okay, yeah, because I know all the guys are going to hold me accountable. Whereas maybe some people don't have that support system, I'm assuming. Great. Oh my gosh, that's the best point ever. And oftentimes, actually, when I talk to athletes, I'll say, okay, well, can I talk to your fiance? Can I talk to your girlfriend? Because that helps me help the athlete, right? Mm. Um, getting to know their family members because those people keep them accountable and keep them also motivated. And like you said, I've got people, like I've got a young man now who, I mean, 
His dad went out and bought, you know, some smoothie machine. They've done everything. Like they set up a home gym during quarantine, like they'll do anything. And then you have guys that are really just left out on their own. And those are the ones that I try to also check in with more because I know they don't have that support system. That's tough. It's very yeah, tough. Big time. It's probably one of the things that I've noticed over the years because it's probably, I don't know about you, but when I started kind of coaching and, and, and maybe mentoring people a bit more like four or five years ago, like the, so it's like anything else, right? You look back, you think, why did I do that? Right. You made mistakes and you learn from them. And now I think, okay, I need to touch base with people. Everyone's different. It might be through zoom calls. It might be through phone calls, whatever that is, but just the things that I do now help people stay much more accountable. And one of the biggest reasons is because they have a, like a sense of community aspect to it now. So they're either part of a group that we have other clients in or we've asked, okay, who's around you that can help you and really support you and motivate you. Cause I think one thing that's been massively talked about in the UK is how this, this thing about motivation kind of doesn't exist. Maybe like you have some days you're motivated, some days you, you're not motivated, but it's maybe the systems that you have in place to help you stay consistent. If that I makes like sense. That. I like that. So it sounds like you, like if they don't have a community, you help them develop a community. Yeah, we try to, because in the past I would have potentially, and again, I'm not afraid to say it because I wasn't that great of a coach when I first started, like anybody else might be, yeah. but oh, yeah. What, well, yeah, when I first started, it was very much, okay, they came in the gym, I trained them and I stayed in touch with them. Don't get me wrong, but they didn't have like a bigger sense of belief. And that's the, I forget what it's called this, um, self-determination theory, I think is what it's called. So it's kind of like people like to have something that's bigger than themselves. So they like to, if you can get them to be autonomous, you can educate them and then you can have that community feel then it's almost like they're going to be more accountable and they'll adhere to your programs and your training more. Essentially, that's what it is. Um, but I didn't have that before. I didn't have that before. Yeah, I'd love to hear some of the, the books you've read. It, yeah, it's very interesting. And you bring up great points because as a dietitian, like I look at myself as a coach because you're coaching them, right? Mm. And I think in the beginning, maybe I, like you said, in the beginning, I never really thought of it that way. But as time goes on, you have, just like you do, you have so many conversations that are so outside of nutrition yeah. and it's not just relationship building, but it's getting to know that person. It's getting to know what's their why and what makes them tick. And that's often what I start with, with an athlete. I'm like, you know, especially if it's outside of a team setting, you know, I'll flat out ask them, why do you do this? What do you love about football? Why do you want to make the NFL? Because I need to figure out how motivated they are and to keep them on course when they falter, when they don't have that, you know, necessarily that motivation because you're not like you said you're not going to have it every day um the other interesting thing i'll bring up about the quarantine process is you know when i'm calling athletes um i'm so surprised at you know i figured sometimes it's like the off season maybe they don't want to be bothered or whatever but i'm so surprised that some of them they're so happy and thankful that somebody's checked in on them i mean it's amazing to me like it's just a phone call and you can hear it in their voice and they're like, thank you so much for calling and checking on me. And it's those people that don't have a support system that are most appreciative. Yeah. And I think all, like, even since we started the podcast, like so many things are going through my head because I think, although a lot of us probably put athletes on a pedestal, right? They've got all the money in the world. They have everything they could possibly need, but then everything we're talking about now is so relatable to the average person because They've got just as much pressure as we probably do. Yeah, their pressure is probably more professional in terms of their sport, but you know, we have professional pressure as well at work. But then some people lack support systems, and it almost sounds like a lot of them probably actually lack support systems almost more. Um, they, yep, they are 100% regular people. It's so funny because I forget sometimes when people say things and I'm like, oh, like, because I just look at them all as like you and me, they're regular people, you know, or anybody I would meet out at a grocery store. Um, they, a lot of them have the same issues. Some of them may even have like, um, they, they don't make the money that people think they make. Some of the ones on, you know, on the brink and stuff. So they have financial concerns. They have other concerns. They have a whole host of issues. And I think people forget that they are regular everyday people. Yeah. And they have to basically face the limelight every single day, paparazzi and all the rest. And, oh, so, you know, that's not pressures or stress that we have, but that's like I said, a lot of what we just talked about, I think is quite relatable. So it's interesting. And I think for those that are listening to this, you can kind of go, okay, so they're just regular people just like me. So I think that's important sometimes. Awesome. Um, cool. So I think that was a good, that was a good little bit on habits. And in terms of tracking now, because this is one that 
like I mentioned earlier about the chefs, I would have figured that everything had a barcode potentially that certain athletes like you, to your point, certain athletes probably have chefs that are like very meticulous with their food um, and they know exactly their macros and their splits and guys like, you know, in my head, I'm thinking like LeBron's probably like that. Um, there's probably other guys in, you know, I don't know that much about kind of like MLB um, I know a bit about NFL and stuff, but I'm just trying to think like, I don't know if Pat Mahomes would have his own chef, but he seems pretty chilled out. So maybe not. Um, but what are your thoughts on tracking, I guess, in general? Is that something that you kind of use with your guys or even with your clients? And I was going to ask you as well, do you work solely with athletes at the moment or do you work with general pop too? You know, I, I have a little more time right now just because of everything going on. So I'm starting to work, a, potentially work with some of the general population, okay. but it's been only athletes once in a blue moon like i've got a girl who's a college swimmer she's a former college swimmer i'm working with her she has hypothyroidism um so once in a while i'll take people like that but they always have to be active um but i'm considering opening up to some general population but as far as tracking you know it's funny i think more um non-athletes track than athletes track i like all the tracking systems there is some research you've probably seen where, you know, people who have disorder eating or eating disorders, but usually not a population I work with, I refer that out. Um, you know, they may have issues if they track because they become hyper-focused on it. But I like the idea of it because people become more aware of what they're eating. And when I think about tracking, I think about it in a number of forms, not just the online, like My Fitness Pal and Fat Secret, but also like I have guys literally just take pictures or they write in the notes section of their phone, they type up what they're eating. And that's a way to track. And then I'll go back and go, well, how is this cooked? And sometimes they're like, oh, I don't know, I didn't cook it. We've got to figure that out, you know, because we're trying to meet this specific body composition goal and your progress isn't where I think it should be. So I don't think it's being cooked the way, you know, we discuss. So I think tracking can take multiple forms. Um, and again, it's accountability. It helps people be accountable. What do you think about it? Yeah. I, I think at the beginning, like I mentioned before, I used to probably fall back on my fitness pal too much. And then over the last two to three years, I've really tried to find different methods because the, the, the I guess the approach that I have is I'm trying to find a sustainable method that works for that person. Right. Yes. And whatever that system and that method needs to be, then I need to find it out. And I think that's kind of where I've evolved as a, evolved as a coach. Um, so now I think, okay, my fitness pal might be great for you to track for the first week. So you can become more self-aware of your portions and just actually understand how much you're consuming because I've had clients where, and I have a client now where he's, he's tracking and I'm saying, okay, so your weight's going up, but you're saying you're in a calorie deficit by 600 calories. So there's an, there's an issue there. And I might have to walk over once lockdown is done so I can weigh the food with you. Right. Yeah. And if I need to do that, and again, I'm fortunate enough, he lives four or five houses down from me, ironically. So I will do that once it's done. Um, but then there's other people where and I don't know if you ever heard of the precision nutrition uh, kind yes. of hand portion calculator. So sometimes yeah. I'll refer that to people and say, look, like try this because it could be quite accurate. Um, I think a lot of self care um, kind of mindful eating methods have been coming out. So, you know, try to eat for, to like a seven out of 10 fullness and think about what you're chewing, how much, how many chews does it take, right? Before you digest it. And, you know, is, is it hyper palatable and what is hyper palatable, right? So these are all things that I never would have done before. Um, but I try to, I guess, just pick the right approach to the person for the person. If it doesn't work, then I'll have to reassess. But I do find it quite difficult at times, if I'm honest. Oh, it's very difficult at times. And I love where you say that's where your coaching has evolved because I think when people read like a news article or a blog, they think, oh, this is, the, this is what I need to do. This made this person successful. And like you said, there's no one fit all approach. So um, some people are not going to track no matter what you do. They're just not going to do it. They don't want to do it. It's a, it's a pain, especially for those athletes or people who have a lot, they eat a lot of calories that's more time that they have to go into my fitness pal and go, oh my gosh, I gotta do this, this, and this, you know? And one tablespoon of sour cream, like they're entering more stuff, it's a pain. Mm -hmm. So I think as a coach, you know, which is a great aspect of coaching, you can look back at what like research studies and numbers and go, hey, let me adjust and do this because this is, what this, this is how this works with this particular client. Like I said, tracking can take multiple forms. You don't always need to track, but it is a good a tool for awareness, I think, for sure. 
Mm. Do you find yourself in terms of coaching, do you find yourself, um, do you try to educate your, your clients and I guess the athletes that you work with as much as you can, or do you find that because of the context that you're working with them, because they're very much performance based performance, like orientated that maybe they don't necessarily want the education. They just want the quick results. Does that make sense? Great question. I have both. So I've got guys that they want to know the nuances of different, you know, forms of omega threes or they want to know exactly what curcumin does and how it works in the body and how it's different than like a nascent, like an ibuprofen. And then I have guys, in fact, I had one last week who said, Marie, I don't want to know all this stuff. You just tell me what to eat. And it's interesting because you brought up some of those aspects of like intuitive eating or, you know, um, basically adjusting how you think about food and stuff. And sometimes I can incorporate some of those, but a lot of times because of their schedule, I can't. Like they might have to eat when they're not hungry. Um, and that's where, again, some of those people that are like this one size fit all approach, I'm like, that doesn't work in sports. It doesn't work in life to me, but it doesn't work in sports because of their schedule. Sometimes they're going to have to eat when they're not hungry. Um, you know, and they might have to follow a different plan that, you know, than what is absolutely ideal. So we can make the best of their performance and recovery. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It makes total sense. And that's what I kind of figured. I thought there'll be some guys that want to know all the detail. And then some guys are just like, just give me the food. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I said, there are people that probably listen to your podcast. You know, there are athletes that listen to other podcasts and they're reading and they're curious and they're going to ask me questions. And then there are some that they don't, they don't want to know. It's like me when I go to, you know, like a, at the Apple store, I just tell me what computer to buy. Here's what I need. I don't need to know all the details because you know mm. what? I'm going to forget them. Yeah, defo. Cool. And just curious too, because of, you know, the coronavirus and, and lockdown um, and because there's been, I don't know how many articles about like apple cider vinegar and garlic mm -hmm. and all this stuff that can help kind of immune system boosting, I guess, just in terms of what you're recommending for your athletes and even just general pop kind of what is the main recommendation when it comes to just helping immune system? In general, I got the dog coming in. Don't worry. Yeah, it's funny you got your coworker coming in. Yeah. Um, number one, eat enough total calories every day if you don't have to lose weight, and then try to adjust it. You know, try to diet on the most calories possible. I think I heard that from uh, another professional. I don't remember who, but eat enough total calories. Make sure you're eating. You know, if you're vitamin D level, and that's where if they haven't been checked, they'll kind of look at their sun exposure you know, what they're eating and stuff. And I may tell them, hey, go ahead and supplement. Make sure you have, you know, adequate vitamin D because there's a link between vitamin D and at least risk of upper respiratory tract infections um, and total days sick. And then we'll look at other foods, you know, how much produce do they get in their diet? Are they needing, you know, their vitamin A needs, vitamin E needs, et cetera, vitamin C to ensure that they're eating a healthy, varied diet to get all those nutrients that support immune function. And of course, gut health, since most of the immune system is in the gut. Yeah, that was literally just about to, to ask about that. Is that one thing that you tend to focus quite a bit of your time on, just gut health? It is. And you know what I've seen in recent years? I've seen a lot more people with gut issues, whether it's irritable bowel syndrome. You know, I've got a couple, I've got a couple of pro athletes with IBD, irritable bowel disease, or um, disease, basically like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, but I do see more gut issues and I do focus a lot on that because they're constantly stressed, you know, flying different places, you know, tough practice, tough game, et cetera. So they may have some level of, hey, my immune system isn't functioning as well as it can be. Uh, so I do focus on the gut health and then, you know, immune health. And I love adding some of those foods like, you know, kefir, yogurt, uh, homemade sauerkraut, stuff like that, that has natural probiotics in it to feed. I was just about to ask that. So would you, would you tend to, when it comes to gut health, I guess, just incorporate certain, I guess, foods rather than look at supplements first, or would you recommend supplements in general? Cause you can go buy probiotics everywhere. Can't you now? Everywhere. I often recommend food, food. And then I recommend high fiber because when I look at people's diets, I don't know if you see this, but most people don't meet the dietary fiber needs in the U S I think people get on average half the fiber they need each day or less. So I do focus a lot on fiber to feed the bacteria in your gut. I focus on probiotic rich foods. Sometimes I do incorporate probiotics, but they're usually very targeted because the thing I find with probiotics is you can't just go to a store and pick anything because as I always say to male athletes, you know, that might be for curing infant diarrhea. That's not what, what you need, you know, that particular strain and species. 
So I try to be very specific about it. Okay. That's really helpful because I've noticed, um, and I had um, a biochemist on a recent episode and she was kind of going into a bit of detail. And I remember asking about, about, um, probiotics and I remember when I took I bought some randomly because I thought okay like worth a try but it didn't really gel with my body for some reason if anything I thought I had a kind of a weird reaction to it so I just stopped completely um, and I don't really think I needed it but I just thought if ever I was going to try to I guess maintain or improve my gut health um, what would I use And I think that's really helpful so thank you for that um, Great. So in terms of carbs and macro splits, and again, I know you mentioned like meal frequency quite often. So I was going to ask you in terms of do your, do any of your athletes fast or have like some kind of fasting rituals, like 16, eights and things like that uh, before I kind of move on. I was just curious. They do. I've had a couple guys do what I call, they call it intermittent fasting. I call it time restriction. So I have some guys that do like a time restriction and some do um, that, you know, 16, eight window. I've had a few do that, like actually two relief pitchers in the past I've had do that. Um, in general, depending on the person, they've, you know, they actually feel a little bit better. They feel better fasting. And it's not the guys that need, because if you're 300 pounds, I can't imagine trying to fast and eat. You need all your calories and all your protein spread out in eight hours. Like you can't really do it well. So it depends on the position, the sport, the athlete, but I have some people that, you know, they feel great on it. So hmm. I'm pretty open to approaches as long as not, I know it's not going to harm them. And if it's done at the right time. And again, when I've got like a relief pitcher and he comes in and he says, Hey, I feel great on this. And I look at him and I'm like, okay, his body comp's good. His strength numbers are up. We can go with it. Then. I'm okay with this because you're, you're doing it where, you know, you're getting your calories at 12 at three, you know, at seven or eight, whatever time, um, depending on when the game is, you know, and they may adjust it where some days it might be a little bit of a longer window. I'm okay with it as long as we closely watch them and they give, you know, give me feedback on how they feel. Yeah. Cool. That's interesting because it's one of those, I think a lot of people have been asking me about it recently and I've had a few people on podcasts talk about it. And I think a lot of the evidence is more so anecdotal from what I can see. Like, and I think that's what, I think that's what's challenging probably more so for you because I think a lot of people go and they get, you know, stuck down the rabbit hole reading all these things and watching all these YouTube videos. But then when you go look at the literature and I guess like when I have, and you probably, obviously you've read a lot more than I have, but I go looking for stuff out there and there's not really that much that I can find to really yeah. kind of like to, I guess, back up any claims I want to make or because everything just seems very anecdotal from what I can tell. Yep, And um, I actually have some posts coming up on like intermittent fasting I'm excited about, but they're going to take a while because I am going to have to read everything. But the thing about intermittent fasting, I always say is, you know, if you're using it for weight loss, it's no better than calorie counting. But hey, if cutting off that time, and I've done this before, I've said to athletes, stop eating at 8 p.m. because that 8 p.m. is a cue and they usually, you know, less than healthy food after 8 p.m. So if that works for you and it's not harmful, we can try it. But like you said, it's, it's more anecdotal than anything. And it's no better than calorie counting for weight loss, but it might be an easier method for them to sustain because they might not want to count calories. Mm, definitely. And I know, I know when I listened to the podcast you had with um, Paul favorites, right? PGF performance. Um, go check out his podcast, by the way, if you're a basketball fan, it's definitely a, a go to watch, but um I know you talked about the plant-based diet and I just wanted to, again, cause I'm curious and I'm being selfish, but would you say a lot of your athletes at the moment who are very much performance kind of goal based are starting to make that switch? Cause I know there was a big, there was a, not a big trend, but I noticed there was a trend. I think in the last two years where like Kyrie Irving went into the, I'm going to be a complete vegan um, or veggie. And then a few other athletes started doing it. And then to your point on the podcast, we're oh, talking about yeah. how, yeah, you can do it, but it's hard to get your protein intake in. So plant-based might be the best approach. So has that been kind of like a big thing that's starting to kind of come out now? Yes. Huge trend, huge trend. And in fact, you brought up, um, you know, I also like Cam Newton was interested in it or doing, I think vegan, uh, last year, I remember before the NFL season, I read this big spread in one of the newspapers about three of the Washington Redskins players that were supposedly going vegan. And I do find people get vegan and plant-based confused. So they might say they're vegan, but they're really plant-based. But I had an NFL player just yesterday who came to me, um, and I've known him for four or five years since before he went in the NFL. And we went through everything. And I thought, you know, why is he doing, why is he doing this? 
what's the reason? I always want to get behind the reason. Okay, let's start adding some more foods in because you don't need to go this, you don't need to cut out this many foods to get the result you want, you know, to get, hey, let me lower my injury risk as much as possible and perform well. In fact, it might be detrimental to performance. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's interesting because I know I've noticed that's a big trend. I know you spoke about it and then the Game Changers came out and yeah, it was just a crazy time. Um, and something just came in my head because you keep saying, obviously, you're working with all these, these, uh, these players. And uh, the real question is, how good is your memorabilia collection at your house? Like you must have it's some not, I, don't, I, don't, I don't collect anything. Really? Isn't that crazy? Not really. I, some people give me things like a signed you know, a signed picture. I have dad of a pro basketball player, give me a signed picture. I'll get stuff like that. Um, years ago when I was, uh, and I still work in this one training facility in Atlanta, I get some guys signatures because they are I'm able to do it. You know, I'm not allowed in a sports team setting, ask them for anything, but I get some of that for my nephews when they're really young. Um, stuff like that, but I don't have a ton of stuff. Actually. Okay. I was just, I was just curious because I thought you must have a pretty cool room in your house and yeah. Must be nice, but it's all right. Good for you. Good for you. Okay. Um, okay. So I thought carbs and macro split would be a cool little topic of discussion because I was reading, so I read a study the other day about uh, basically just two groups. One was like ultra processed food. One was uh, just kind of more whole food based. And a lot of people t tend to think that if fiber and protein are controlled, then nothing else matters. Right. And I think that's a big, like if it fits your macros, um, kind of approach that again comes and goes and depending on who the fitness expert is or who the PT is they might use and I thought this would be a cool question to ask because I think a lot of people are very very hell-bent on I have to eat either this amount of carbs and fats in my diet or it just doesn't matter altogether um, and in the study basically just showed that people with ultra processed diets just tend to eat more even when they're told not to they just can't stop um, so I thought, I guess for, even if it's just athletes or the average Joe out there, what do you tend to do when it comes to structuring your macros? Like, do you have a certain, I guess, is there a guideline in place or do you just kind of like play with it based on the person? Um, I, I kind of play with it based on the person. I like that you brought up the carbs and fat because, you know, what the research shows is it really doesn't matter your split of carbs and fat as long as you get enough protein. Like if you're trying to lose weight, if you get enough protein to attenuate muscle losses, decrease the loss of muscle on a you know, on diet, what you eat as far as carbs and fat, doesn't matter. You can split them any way you like. But what I do with athletes, because they generally need more carbohydrate, although it depends on the person. Some of them feel a little bit better on a little bit more fat, so I'll adjust it. Or they like the palatability of the fat. I start with protein, their protein needs, based on where they are, what they're looking to achieve, body comp wise. Make sure, and then from there, I give them at least the minimum amount of fat and then make sure they have enough carbohydrate. And sometimes, you know, I might have to play with it a little and go, okay, proteins are a little bit too high because I got, I need more carbohydrate so they can perform. So then I'll adjust it as need be. So obviously a lot easier when people have higher calorie diets than it is when you're cutting calories. That's where you're really kind of playing with it. But the reality is like you try to hit that and you give them serving sizes and you're close. You might not be exact, you know, it's not, MMA where they're weighing and measuring everything. Hmm. So I guess, would you say like, for the most case, is there usually a trend where the guys that do want to perform better, you tend to kind of tweak their carbs for the most part? Cause I think that's a big one, I guess, in, in, in the, in my experience with the people I've worked with. And I even had a guy messaging me on Instagram yesterday and he was just saying, Oh, I'm trying to lose weight. So I've just reduced my carbs. I'm like, okay, so you've just reduced your calories. You haven't, you know what I mean? That's why you're going to lose weight. He's like, Oh, so it doesn't matter. And he thought that by reducing his carbs, he was actually going to promote fat burning. I'm like, well, that's not really how it works. It's just calories in, calories out. And then I educated him on it. He goes, oh, that's really helpful. Thank you. I think that's one big thing that a lot of people tend to rely on is I'm just going to drop my carbs. But I guess, again, yep. it's dependent on the person, isn't it? Yep. And it's like you said, they can drop their carbs. They're dropping calories. The other thing I focus on, like you said, is the, you know, the ultra processed foods. And another reason... It's not just that they're hyper palatable, but you absorb more calories from ultra processed foods. So that's another reason I'd rather see somebody, you know, eat um, less processed, like whole grain bread versus white bread, real cheese versus processed cheese, stuff like that. We'll make some of those adjustments because they'll, they won't absorb as many calories. So it's a way to adjust that calorie balance as well. 
Okay. It, why do they, why do they absorb it quicker? Is it just because they're more refined? It's they're more refined, they're broken down. The body doesn't have to do much work. So you think about, there's been studies on nuts versus nut butters. There's been study, a study on um, like basically a cheese sandwich, whole, um, whole grain bread with real cheese versus uh, white bread with processed cheese. They actually absorb more calories from the white bread processed cheese. It's already broken down. And when it comes to nuts, like our body doesn't totally break down the cell walls to absorb all the calories. And generally it's the fat we're not absorbing as much of compared to like a nut butter that's already broken down. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. Did not know that. Um, and I'm assuming like, again, cause I know you said some of the guys go out all the time. What's the go-to place that most athletes eat fast food in the Chipotle. States? Chipotle? Chipotle. Really? Cause exactly. I would have, I would have thought like on the West coast, especially it's like, what is it like Chick-fil-A and all those like great burger places or something. But yeah, I know Chipotle. I used to, I used to work in, in, um, in the States and East Hampton and every summer I used to go and, and basically travel the state. So Chipotle is great. Love it. Chick-fil-A is popular too. It's very yeah. popular. I've actually never been, you know, it's on my, it's on my list. I need to try it. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay. No, I know. I should, I might as well just open one up. Right. So yeah. a lot of fish and chip places though, if ever you want one, come over here. We apparently have the best. So. I don't think, I don't know that Chick-fil-A would do well against fish and chips. <laughs> yeah. You never know. You never know. Uh, cool. That's cool. And I, I know like this, this next bit. So we always do um, a flavor of the week segment on every podcast. And usually what I do is I'll bring up like an article that I recently read and I'll, I'll kind of get people's thoughts on it. Uh, but because I know that you've read a million articles and you've actually kind of dropped quite a few knowledge bombs today, which is really awesome. So thank you again for that. Um, I just thought I'd get your three recommendation when it comes to nutrition, I guess, for the average person. I know you've already kind of answered this question like through the podcast, but maybe just to summarize or reiterate, what's kind of your three kind of non-negotiables that you would always work through someone first or work um, with somebody through it? The one is a whole foods. We talked about that quite a bit. Whole, less processed foods. I think the more people can move to that, they'll get in general, they get more nutrients in their diet. They'll feel a little bit more full, especially for the average person, especially if you're trying to lose weight. Um, they won't absorb as many calories. The second thing I would actually put in there is uh, fluid consumption. So most people in general, according to the research, half of people and half of athletes, same thing. They start the day or they start practice dehydrated. Just drinking more fluid, you'll feel so much better. Um, for some people, they'll have a lot less constipation. And then also, you know, they'll think more clearly. Um, if you're an athlete, you'll perform better, especially in the heat. So I think that's critical. And then the third thing would probably be um, making sure that they get enough protein and fiber every day. So those two, I put both of those in there and get that protein spread out. So they get enough at each meal to maximize muscle mass or at least decrease muscle loss if they're dieting or if they're getting older. Because we know that um, lower muscle mass as you get older, it's a, it increases your mortality risk. So even if I'm working with somebody that's 22, I wanna, you know, and let's say they just finished, you know, they're not a competitive athlete. You wanna set them up for a lifetime of healthy eating habits to make sure that they age in a way where they're still, you know, living independently as long as possible, right? That's important. So that's why I put protein in there and fiber because, you know, only half of us get our daily fiber needs. Yeah, definitely. And I know you posted about the um, protein kind of intake. If you distribute it evenly throughout the day, it's better than having kind of like spikes throughout the day. Um, I've noticed a few people post that recently and I read that study as well before. So it's good that people are posting that and sharing that information. I think it's important because um, again, it comes back to the whole kind of timing of food. And sometimes I think we tell people, well, it doesn't matter, but sometimes it does matter. So it's kind of nice to have a bit of both. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's funny when I went to post that, I almost like I started writing it and then I was like, oh, I should just scrap this because there were a couple of things I wish they had done in that study a little bit better. And I thought, doesn't everybody know this? And I was floored at the number of people that responded. And I thought, oh, okay, people don't know this. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the original research studies came out a few years back from UT Galveston. But um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's an important, important topic still. 
Definitely. And I know you just mentioned on protein as well, just before I, I ask you about alcohol quickly, because I know you posted some stuff on that recently, which is quite interesting is um, you mentioned, you know, as you get older, you should probably um, prioritize protein. So, you know, cause my mom and dad listen to every single podcast, like my biggest fans, which is nice. Um, so in terms of protein, then, you know, as they're getting older, should they be increasing the amount they eat? in your opinion, or should they just be kind of like maintaining, because they eat pretty much protein with every meal, uh, but do you think they should be increasing it? Um, as long as they get enough, so a very minimum of 1.2 grams per kg of body weight, kilogram body weight for older adults. Um, I often go higher than that, again, to attenuate those muscle losses, because we know once people hit between, the research varies. Sometimes it stays between 50 and 60, sometimes 40 and 60. They start to lose muscle mass with age. Well, the only, the two things you can do to prevent that are, hey, lift weights or work out, do some resistance training. And then the second thing is eat enough total protein. So, um, and eat it spread out at each meal, three, four meals during the day. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, and then last, last bit on alcohol, because this is a big one. Um, yeah. And in the UK, everybody's just itching for the pubs to open up. So, you know, really? I, oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's, I never, I didn't, I never realized how many bars and pubs there were in a place until I moved to the UK. It's ridiculous. Like it's nice because it's always really social, but I'm not even kidding. Every single corner has a pub in the UK. Um, it's a social aspect because people would drink alone or they could go outside and, you know, sit six feet from each other and have a drink. So it's the social aspect they like. Yeah, big time. Um, so I guess if you just uh, could, I guess, summarize what you recently posted about alcohol, that'd be, that'd be great. And then just kind of like your thoughts on it, um, maybe from like a performance perspective. And if you advise your athletes to maybe drink in moderation, or do you tell them to stay away from it, but they just don't listen to you, that'd be great. You know, I had a strength coach many years ago when I was working with the NHL team say, before I was giving a talk, he goes, Marie, don't get up there and tell them they can't drink alcohol. You've got the number one player on this team, well-known, you know, hockey players. He said he'll drink X amount on the way home from a, a game. And I was like, okay. So that's what I really learned that you can't just say no, but you can't say moderation. Hey, okay? less is best. And that's usually my message. The less alcohol is better for you for a number of reasons. You don't sleep as well. Um, it dehydrates you. It can alter performance maybe a couple of days after. The research on that is kind of iffy. For men, it can really decrease um, muscle protein synthesis, your ability to put on muscle, potentially based on the timing after you work out. But, you know, if you're chronically drinking four or five, six drinks a day, well, number one, that's too much anyway, but it's going to interfere with your body's ability to gain muscle. And usually when I say that, that's when people go, like I had a minor league baseball player tell me this past winter, he said, Marie, when you told me that last year, I just stopped drinking because he knows he needs to gain weight to get to the major leagues. And I was like, oh, so that was the cue. It didn't get you off the dip that you're doing, but it got you off the alcohol. Okay, we're good. At least we made progress there. Um, and the other thing is people always say, hey, alcohol um, is heart healthy. Well, it's really not heart healthy. It increases stroke risk. It increases coronary artery disease um, and coronary artery events. So in both types of strokes, hemorrhagic or bleeding strokes, as well as clotting strokes, um, plus the research, when you look at it, you're, you're grouping all these people who don't drink into this category of, oh, they're non-drinkers, but they might be non-drinkers because they already have a disease state. And then you're looking at these two groups over time and going, oh, the non-drinkers have increased uh, mortality from X disease. Well, they had a disease state to begin with. So it's a very difficult thing to research. Um, so again, I always say less is best, but you know what? If you need a little bit of alcohol or you like your red wine or the pub to enjoy life, so be it. Yeah, because I guess some would argue, well, I'm happier and it's less stressful and stress is bad for me too, right? Um, and I, so. I understand that, yeah, and I understand that. And that's where, you know, I say, just time it. Um, you know, I try to be pretty reasonable, just time it. And if, you know, yeah, that makes you feel good going to the pub, being around people, just moderate your alcohol consumption. Don't do it the night before a game or a big event or anything. Hmm. Yeah, defo. That's good advice. And just on, on that, lastly, I know you posted something recently to do with gut health, wasn't it? Probably, yeah. Yeah, I think it was that alcohol consumption affects uh, the gut in a way. I forget exactly what the post was. It was one of your recent ones. 
Um, worst case, I'll dig it out and I'll put it in the descriptions okay. uh, of the show notes. But yeah, I saw, I think I saw that one on yours too. But um, listen, Marie, that was fantastic. That was very, very insightful, very good information. So just want to thank you for your time today. Um, no, defo. And you know, maybe in the future we'll, we'll get you on again, but I'm assuming you're gonna be really, really busy soon because of all the, everything happening in the leagues right now. Um, do you guys still kind of hit you up quite often and kind of going, Oh, I need to get ready. I need to get ready. Some do. And some are very, you know, I feel like the ones that are um, going to come out the best, they have a schedule. Like they take this as, Hey, I'm training. It's January. The season's starting soon. Those are the ones that tend to do better. With football players, they're on a little bit of a schedule now. Um, but others, you know, I know there are athletes out there not doing much. And I think who knows what's going to happen. I'm, I tend to wonder if we'll have sports at all in the rest of this year. But, um, yeah, some are very on top of it. Some are not. Mm, but I yeah. do get hit up a lot. And it's funny. You talk about people's communication patterns. Some people text, some call, some FaceTime, some DM me. It's like all, people have so many different communication ways. And when you were talking about coaching and habits, you have to learn how to, you know, what works best for them. You also have to learn to, how to communicate with them because there's so many modes of communication. Yeah, definitely. I can just, well, I can't imagine because I'm not in your shoes, but yeah, it must be difficult. Um, but no, that was fantastic. So we always kind of just do a bit of an outro. Um, I'm going to save the quick fire questions. I usually do some quick fire questions, put you on the spot, but you've, you've been really helpful today. Uh, so I might let you off. Uh, but Marie, if you want to just kind of tell the people where they can find you, social media and all the rest, and I'll, I'll always put these in the show notes too, just to make it easier. Sure. Um, social media, I'm on Instagram, pretty active on Instagram. Um, I'm trying to be a little bit more active on Twitter. It's Marie Spano on both because my name's not that common. So it, then my website's mariespano.com. Pretty easy. I told my parents years ago, I go, it's good people can find me, but it's bad people can find me. So, you know, it depends. Um, but my name, it's just the easiest way to find me on any social media. And then also on Facebook. Awesome. Well, uh, as always, I'm Dan Kirion. I just tell people to call me Dan Q because it's a tough French last name. Um, I'm the guy behind the podcast. You can find me at Abonte Performance. So same thing, all social media channels. I'll post all the kind of details for where you can find Marie uh, in the description. But Marie, massive thank you again for your time today. Really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and just stop this right here.